Lounging Sun. All right, welcome back to the Comic Lounge. And today uh, I'm going to do a different type of episode. I got Dewey from Comics Cube, and we're just going to kind of talk about our experience with uh, running YouTube channels and kind of, I, I mean, maybe get into a little bit of why we started it. Um, it's huge pleasure to have you on the show, dude. It's a huge pleasure to be here, man. Like, I really like your show. Like, I think maybe I'm aware of four other, um, you know, interview channels. And, like, yours is the one I've watched the most. Because I know, like, there's Kayfabe. Right. And there's all the rest of us. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. I know. I think it's, I think it's, um, for me, like, I started because of the group that we're both a part of on Facebook, right? Like I, I had a website, I was doing written interviews, transcribing them, which was, I hated, I hated, tra- it would take me hours to transcribe. Cause I didn't even think about getting like an actual program to transcribe it. And then finally, when I figured out that I could get one of those, like on the cheap, it was so bad in terms of like the way they transcribed it, like the words I'm like, well, now I have to listen to it anyway, and then edit this transcription service. So um yeah the pandemic totally fucking helped me uh just kind of boost it. I'm like you know I got the time I'm gonna just do the YouTube channel and it's funny um sometimes there's been overlap with like the kayfabe track. I think you and I have even had where we've do- where we've interviewed the same people and it's like I don't even notice you know or I- I'll have already had it recorded there was a there was a video that I had recorded of like a book and I just didn't edit it yet, you know, because I was banking episodes and and then Jim posted the video. I'm like, God damn it. Like, I don't want, and I was planning on posting it like around that time. I think it was like a holiday issue. And I was like, ah, whatever, I just got to do it. You know what I mean? Like I already recorded it. Um, but I think the cool thing about all of us is that we all have different styles of the way we interview. You and I don't ask like the type of questions that Ed and Jim ask, you know? Yeah, they get we more. don't ask the same type of questions we, we ask. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because you and I. What are your different styles? So, yeah, sometimes I watch you. Sometimes I watch like an interview that you do, uh, right before I'm about to interview that person. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, cool. I wasn't gonna ask those questions anyway. Yeah, I think I think part. I think maybe I should start doing that. I should start like watching specific people that I want to interview that you've interviewed, and then maybe I'll kind of like manifest that into terms of getting it. Because I think, like, I, I don't know what, like, I, I think it's kind of interesting. Like, what's your approach when you're going to interview somebody? Like, how do you reach out to them? Because I, I mean, I know I've, I have, di- I have my ways that, that I do it. But, like, how do you go about, like, getting people on the show? I message them on Facebook. That's it? <laughs> what, what do you do? I, dude, oh, man. I'm, like, I have, like, searched and searched. I'll go on LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> I, I started using LinkedIn recently i've done that but it hasn't worked for me but yeah it, go ahead. it's only worked um once so far and i haven't even done the interview yet but he actually responded dan to deal and it's because i wanted to ask him about i wanted to ask him about this whole publishing thing with frank miller right um yeah a lot of it too has been um i've done instagram i've messaged through instagram that yeah, has same. worked um email contact form through their website yeah contact form through the website sometimes that works sometimes it doesn't um i like facebook because i know if they've read the message <laughs> you know <laughs> so so if if they've read it but haven't responded i use that as like okay well they've definitely seen this message so they're just either not responding because they don't want to or they just like clicked it open and just like kind of went by because i mean i do that right like I, I open a message but i don't really read it you know and i just i'm busy or whatever um A lot of it's been in the beginning was through email. Mm. Like I would, I would somehow find their emails and I would do it that way. I think like the first one I ever did was from my site and it was Ed Brubaker. I had no posts on my website, nothing. I had no articles. I think I, or maybe two posts and he responded and it, but it was via email. And since then I've gotten him on the show, but he is, he's a tough nut to crack dude. You know what I mean? Bendis. I got him in the beginning, I got, again, when I had nothing on my site and I've never been able to get him again. Like I cannot, almost a two hour phone conversation with him, but I like, and I'm not going to post it now because it's like kind of like 
it's outdated a little bit. So I don't, I don't really want to, and I sound a little bit like, it's like one of my first interviews on the phone. So I like, you can kind of hear the nervousness of me talking to Bendis. It's hard. It's hard trying to find ways to fucking get through to people too. I get really jealous. Cause like, there are some people that you got that won't, that like, I haven't been able to get or like, you know, they, or they haven't responded to me because it's like, it's like you said, sometimes you just read things. I think also what works against me a little bit is the time difference. So like I'll message them and maybe like, maybe it woke them up <laughs> then they really yeah, I've, I've, I've thought about the same thing like sometimes i'll be like in bed it's like 11 o'clock at night i'm like is this kind of too late is this gonna get lost are they just not gonna see it yeah how many times do you follow up before you give up <laughs> uh i'm very persistent jason aaron he, when, he was somebody that i did not give up on i would wait if i get if they if they bite right like if they actually respond and they're like, now's not a good time. Try back. I usually wait like a couple months, you know, mm. like I won't like try back too soon. Right. Like I want to give them a good amount of time. It took almost two years from the get first to- response from, yeah, from him to actually get him to do an interview. But it worked out because I wasn't doing video interviews at the time. So it would have just been written. So it kind of, like, and he even told me, I'm like, hey, I'm sorry I bugged you. Cause I would be like every few months of like, he told me to try back this time and then didn't. And then when I reached back out, he didn't even respond. So I waited another like two weeks and then I responded again. I was like, Hey, you know, you told me to reach out. And then he's like, yeah, it's not good yet. But he told me, I, you know, when I thanked him, he's like, well, you were very persistent. And I, I appreciate that. I was like, Oh, okay. So maybe, you know, like maybe they want to see if like, do you really want to talk to me? Is this like, you know, kind of deal. Or if they don't respond, right. If I don't get any response, I'll wait like a month. Todd McFarlane was somebody that I just continuously. Um, I, I can't believe you got Todd. That was one where I was like, holy crap, you got Todd McFarlane. Yeah, I don't know. I still don't know how I, I got that. I left out. I like reached out to his, um, not, I don't know if it's his assistant or she's in her, in his PR uh, department, but like I kept emailing her and no response. And then I was at work one day at the shop and I, I emailed instantly she responded back and i i almost i almost fell out of the chair because I, I was like what she and she's like yeah he's got some times coming up and then she emailed me like a two days before we were supposed to interview and he's like and she's like he has to cancel because he has to go out of town and i'm like god damn it and then i stopped reading and then i then i was because I, I got upset and then but then i kept reading down I'm like oh but she's like he can reschedule later in the week so I got like, so, I got so disappointed instantly when I said, I saw the word cancel. I don't give up in terms of that. If I, if I feel like I have a good pipeline, if I yeah. don't, if I feel like I'm just shooting into the ether, you know, like it's kind of, I don't want to, I, I feel like I don't want to continuously waste my time trying to get somebody if I don't even know if they're actually like reading the, the message. No. Yeah. I get you. Cause like I used to run, I also used to run a website. And I also do like text interviews and like, I got uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, uh, for that website, but like, you know, it was just messages back and forth. So when I launched a channel and the only reason I launched a channel is because COVID isolation was driving me nuts. And Jose Luis, Gar- you know, I messaged Jose Luis Garcia Lopez and like, he just never replied. And I'm like, all right, I guess he just doesn't want to be, you know, interviewed on video. That's still what I assume it is. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I've I've had that too, where they don't want to do video. Have you yeah, have you got, got a lot of that? Not a lot. No, no, not a lot. Um, I guess maybe the ones who don't reply, who don't want to do video, I'll just never know, right? I mean, I've had I I'll do audio if they say they won't do video, but they'll do audio. I just I'll throw it up there anyway. You know, uh, Kelly Thompson didn't want to do video, but I did audio with her. Uh, Joe Casey recently, I reached out to him. That's another thing where, like, I feel like sometimes they'll say no because I say a YouTube channel. But if they say no, I'm like, well, we could always do audio. Because that, to me, I'm like, I'm willing to just throw up an audio on YouTube, even though I know that that's not the, the format. But I'm like, like you said, you just uh, went on Spotify. Like, that's the beauty of it. Some people don't listen to us necessarily on YouTube, right? Like, they just want to listen. They don't need to look at us while, while we're interviewing. Yeah, I just launched on Spotify, but 
the thing that really uh i still would prefer people watch it on youtube because like there are some uh shows that i have where somebody will pull out a slideshow and like really share stuff and i'm like well if you listen to this you're not going to understand anything yeah like danny fingeroth had like this three hour slideshow on will eisner you, you know it's, it's a slideshow so i'm like well you can listen to it for three hours i don't know if you'll learn anything yeah yeah i think that i mean that's the double-edged sword of like you know like but ed and jim do that uh they put their uh they put their overhead videos on the what's it called on uh they do yeah on spotify on uh well on their podbean because I, I that podbean is the, the host that i use for my pod my audio podcast mm -hmm. so like i follow them on there too and like i can see that they have they don't do every episode like for me if i'm uploading audio i don't upload every episode i only upload interviews or like this conversation we're having right now would be uploaded right because you don't necessarily need to watch what we're what we're saying if we're just having a conversation but if i do my videos where i do the overhead going through a book i don't do it because like i'm referencing something i'm pointing at so it's like well they're not gonna like you said they're not gonna understand what the hell i'm talking about if i'm pointing like hey look at this you know like well what the fuck is he looking at that's true that's true i'm gonna ask you a question who's the yeah. coolest person you have ever interviewed yeah i have an answer for that for me i've interviewed him once you've interviewed him twice uh, I know I've interviewed Scott Snyder twice. I've interviewed Williamson twice. I like talking to Joshua Williamson. Scott Snyder is always a good one. I don't know. Who is it? Who, who, who have I interviewed twice that you like? There is no one I've interviewed that, like, for me, exudes a level of coolness as much as Dennis Cowan. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've interviewed him more than twice. I've interviewed him three times. I did a, a, a an email. No maybe four. I think I've done it four because I, I emailed him the first time when I was on the written site. Then I met him at a rest. I met him at a restaurant out in the, where I live. And I yeah, in interviewed cool. him at the restaurant because he shops at my shop too. Oh, well, not all the time, but my shop is his local comic shop. And then I did again on, on YouTube, but he is really cool. Yeah, man. He's like, not, he doesn't have like that ego, but he knows that he's cool. You know what I mean? Like he, he exudes it, like you said. Yeah, like, it was like I was talking. If, if I didn't know he was a cartoonist, I would have thought he was a rock star. Yeah, he's a, he's, right? he's a really cool guy. I like him a lot. I'm really happy for him that all the milestones stuff finally, like, because I kept asking him every time I'd see him. And I'd be like, okay, how about off the record? Can you tell me anything? And he'd be like, no. Oh, that's a good <laughs> question. Have you ever asked anybody stuff off the record that you personally wanted to know, but you knew they couldn't say if it was recorded? I have been told stuff off the record but you didn't ask that, them they that just I didn't you? ask no oh, okay. like, they, like it just kind of got brought up and and then i've actually asked these people like can i can i record this right now and they're like no you record this right now i'm gonna fly over there and kick the shit out of you <laughs> yeah like uh, mike del mundo um we were during our interview we were talking right and he like had mentioned stuff that he was like working on spawn stuff or whatever. And then the minute that we saw the recording, he's like, so do you want to see the art? And I was like, yes, I want to fucking, what do you mean? What kind of question is that? And then for like the next like 20, 20, 30 minutes, that's something that he showed me. Like, that's something I like too, um, are the creators that I end up talking to after like they, they'll like Sarah Frazetta is yeah, really cool. cool. She's awesome. Yeah. Like we talked this last time because I interviewed her twice. We uh, talked for like 20 minutes before. And then after, you know, which we, we were done recording, we continued to talk, you know. And um, those are the interviews that I really like too, where I don't feel like it's so not robotic, but like we're not, it's not just here to like, okay, let's get this done so I can I can move on with my day. You know, yeah. I like those conversations. Those conversations are really cool. So I'll tell you something that's really cool about Bill Sienkiewicz. Yeah, I'm jealous uh, of that. That's the one I'm fucking jealous of. I, I cannot. I have tried for like three years to connect he, with that dude. It's hard to get. It's hard to. You got you to gotta be patient and <laughs> persistent. Mm -hmm. um, and if his assistant is listening right now, I really want to apologize to her. But <laughs> So the first time he gets on the show, right? Uh, so you go through his assistant and then he gets on the show 
and I ask him one question. And then after that, you know, he answers it and then he's not feeling well. And he said, look, I'm not feeling well. We could either do this tomorrow at the same time or we could push through. And I'm like, all right, we'll do it tomorrow at the same time. That's cool. We start and then he talks to me for three and a half hours. Bill Sinkevich, three and a half hours. Wow. Right. And then, you know, eventually I get him back because I'm like, uh, you know, the whole thing with George Perez was my favorite artist ever. Uh, I'm, you know, I ask if he wants to get in on this little tribute video for, for, for George. And then Bill goes, yeah, okay. So his assistant says, this won't take more than 20 minutes, right? I was like, nah, it won't take more than 20 minutes. I only have like five questions. Hey, we talked for like an hour and a half before we even start talking about George Perez. Yeah. <laughs> And then he gives me 20, he gives me 40 minutes on George Perez. The next longest interview I had about George Perez was 25 minutes long. So he gave me that much time and then we stopped recording and then we talked for like another 30 minutes. That's awesome. That's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. Yeah. There's, there's certain people that like my bucket list, right? Like there's, there's another YouTube channel where he keeps getting these interviews. Um, I think it's Daniel Fee. Oh my like, God. That's I crazy. don't understand how he gets in contact. Like that's, that, that's sometimes what I think. Like when I see you get somebody that I've tried to get, right. I'm like, well, fuck, how did he get through? How did he get in that contact? Right. But I know that Bill Sienkiewicz has like Facebook. So it's like, I know they have the contact forms on their sites so i'm like okay maybe he just got through right but then there's like people like jeff lemire grant morrison and i'm just like who did you contact to get in contact with them you know like that's 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 the thing that drives me crazy sometimes when i see that some, kid is 13 years old i know it drives me nuts <laughs> no, nothing, 13 years old nothing against got grant him. morrison and frank whitely on his yeah. channel nothing against him like i'm not trying to throw shade but he, oh, he has the time, obviously. He's 13, so he's, you know. And he's good, too. Yeah. Like, what the hell? <laughs> Where yeah, do you crazy. get this from? It's not. No, but, yeah, but, dude, the thing about Sienkiewicz, though, is, like, I can't get over how humble he is because I'm like, this guy is legitimately in contention for being the greatest of all time, right? Yeah. Like, like just maybe not in terms of being, a you know, a comic book storyteller. I think, you know, he's a little too uh unconventional for that but like in terms of just pure raw talent of being an artist he could be the greatest artist comics has ever had and he's like so humble i can't believe it like to me scott snyder is very humble when i talk to him you know he's very gracious um there's a there's a lot of creative i'm trying to like think of the ones but like you can tell going into it like pretty early on in the conversation the people that are humble and don't have this like huge huge ego i mean i'm not going to say the people i've talked to that i don't have huge egos because you can look at my interviews and, and you know the people that have the egos right like it's not they're very outspoken i mean we already talked about it like todd you know what i mean like he's he's got a huge ego and rightfully so you know he's very very fucking successful in what he's done um but and yeah he wouldn't I, have been successful if he didn't have that huge ego definitely not i think it's yeah. like the personality right it's also the era like you don't see creators that are like that anymore. I, I like, I always like talking to the image guys too, like Eric Larson, Valentino, Liefeld was a hard get. That was, that was another one where like, it was only audio. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to say no. Like this might be the only time I fucking can talk to somebody, you know? So, but yeah, I mean, is there anybody, is there anybody that like is on your bucket list of creators you really want to get? Dude, number one right now is Jason Aaron. Because I love that Thor run so much. That's like one of and, my favorite runs of all time, yeah. And obviously, I would like to talk to him before July. But have you do? Have you tried reaching out? Yeah, and I've um, you know I've spoken to Torun like three times, uh, and he's actually responded. He said he'd love to do it. We just have to work out a time. But oh yeah, because the schedule is that is that what's he's really busy so. Also, like, I don't know if this affects anything, but, you know, he was in the middle of that controversy, like, maybe a month or so back. And, which is, like, 
I can imagine like being in the middle of that and being like, I don't want to talk to anyone right now. I think that uh, that's that's definitely something that drives me crazy um, with comic fandom nowadays. Not the I don't want to say the cancel culture, but I feel like people just look for problems. You know, they're just looking for problems now. They make mountains out of molehills. I mean, that's, that's the best way I could describe it. You know. Yeah, I mean, like if it was a problem, like you could have addressed it, and uh, you know, it didn't have to be a huge thing or anything. But I don't know, like. It's, it's it's on both ends, you know. People are like, "Oh no, uh, um, who was your, who's on your bucket list aside from Sinkovich? Lemire, Morrison. I definitely my one of my goals, like early on, was I wanted to get all the image founding fathers. You know what I mean? Like that's I so so far I've had what I've had Larson, Valentino, McFarland, and Lightfeld. Jim Lee is a is probably never going to happen. Um, I rarely see him do interviews unless it's like some big outlet. Obviously, Wills Protasio, I, I really want to get him on. I've talked to his wife. It's just still haven't got anything locked down. And then Sylvester, obviously. I think Jim Lee's a hard get because I've spoken to people who are executives in D.C. And they said that like, Every interview that a DC executive has to do has to like be vetted through the DC offices. And Jim Lee's like a top DC executive, right? So yeah. Well, maybe I can't. I can't even get Mike Carlin, who because I just want to talk about Superman in the nineties, right? Yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's like, yeah, I can't. I'm not. Uh, I'm not authorized by DC to give interviews. <laughs> that's stupid. I know. That's that's another thing where like. I had gotten connected with a PR guy at DC. He helped me get like a couple interviews, right? And um, then there was other creators where they're like, oh, I have to run it by DC. And I'm like, oh, is this the contact? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, that dude never responds to me. Like I literally have been, res he's responded sometimes, but then he just doesn't respond after. And it's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit here and, and beg for an interview either it's like i don't want to feel like i'm wasting my time and then i ran into him at a con and i was like and I, I just called i was like what's up dude like you told me to email you and but you don't respond to my messages so like what is the next step like i, I want to get this interview like it's not like i'm doing this for money like this is free publicity like i'm showcasing something that you guys are doing like I, i'm not making money off this i think that especially when you have to go through the publisher that that has been like one of the hardest things where like Liam Sharp, one of the first ones I did with, oh, yeah. um, he's like, we have to do it through DC because it's when he's doing Green Lantern, Tom King, you know, I actually saw Tom King in person and he told me, oh, you have to run it by this guy. And he said he would do the interview, but then, you know, like I tried reaching out to the DC person and he straight up told me, he's like, you don't have enough followers on Twitter. He straight up told me that. Like, that was that was his response. Like, you need to have a bigger following on Twitter for, like, some of these creators to actually come on your show. And, I, and I'm like, but what? I had no Twitter account, and Bendis said yes. Scott Snyder said yes. And Brubaker said yes. You know, and this is, this is just written interviews, so why the hell won't they do it? You know, like, that doesn't make sense to me. It's really frustrating. I got, you know, I, I, I haven't had that experience with DC creators because I've I regularly have Jeff Thorne come on. Yeah, he's cool. He's awesome because, like, the conversation will just go in every direction possible. Uh, you know, Bruno Redondo has been on, like, three times. Uh, it, it's always cool with Bruno because I'm just like, I really like your art. Here's an image. Talk about this image. Yeah. It's so, so easy. So in terms of, like, reaching out to creators, how do you, how do you decide who you want to talk to? And, and who do you decide, like, how do you decide, oh, I want to have this person back on? Because, you know, some people just want to do it the one time and they're cool. They don't care about having anybody back on the show. I think like Ed and Jim, for instance, like they interview people once. Yeah. They've had like Jeff Darrow going through a book or they've had Frank Quietly going through a book. Dave Gibbons going through a book with them, but not necessarily interviewing them. Right. So how do you decide who you want to have back on? I think, like, and I'll throw that question right back at you right after, but, like, I think a lot of it has to do with if I still have questions left, if they're going to plug anything 
extra, you know, afterwards, mm-hmm. like, like, uh, you know, Turin is doing that new Thor, uh, the new Thor series back uh, in, uh, in June. So I'm like, well, I got to talk to her about that. Cause I love, I love that Thor run, Thor run, Turin. With J.H. Williams the third, I actually asked him, like, would you like to do an issue by issue recap of Echo Lands? And that's because he's my current favorite um, comic book artist who, who's currently active. Um, and he said, yeah. And then somebody like Jeff Thorne, you know, he's just somebody that he, he's fun to talk to. And I'm like, hey, what about a semi regular recap of Green Lantern? And then Danny Fingeroth always has a lot to say. Uh, and then there are some people, man, like I spoke to Walt Simonson for two hours. I feel like I still have questions. He's <laughs> another one. I can't, I can't correct. I, I could probably, uh, I'll see what I can do about that. Maybe. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. What, I, the one that I can't get to is, uh, is Wheezy. Cause I'd love to talk to her too. Same here. Same here. I think I messaged her also. Cause I think yeah. she, somebody cool to like pick her brain too, you know? Yeah, and I notice I never see an interview with Wheezy that's not with Walt. Yeah, and she's an accomplished creator in her own right that, like, you could talk to her for hours, and and she would have, I was sure she'd have endless stories. Creator, editor. No. Right? She was the model for that Swamp Thing cover. That first ever Swamp Thing cover. Yeah, the the woman brushing her hair. Oh, weird. Yeah, I never knew that. Yeah, that's her. Oh, did you know that... uh, Bill Sienkiewicz's model for Electra Assassin. You know who it's it was? Ama- Amanda Connor. It was Amanda Connor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know I, about that. I know my uh one of my friends I told him that. He's like, no. I was like, yeah. He he had I don't even know where I heard that. I think I might have heard it in or heard it or read it from Amanda Connor. That's how I found out. Because I couldn't believe it. I'm like, wow, that's so random. You know? Right? Yeah. How, how do you know? Like, why do you who do you, why do you reach out to the people you reach out to more than once? Um, more if it's more than once, it's usually if I felt like the conversation was pretty easy with them, and or plug something new. Like if there's something new that's come out, if it's been a good amount of time, and I felt like like I don't want to do it too soon. Obviously, like Jim Valentino, I did twice, right? But the second time was to actually third time, I guess. It's it's hard. Like second time on YouTube, third time overall, but yeah, timeline that he put out, right? Like I felt like okay, this would be cool. 30th anniversary, like to talk about that. But yeah, mostly it's it, like if I have like a, I don't want to say a bad experience, but if I interview somebody and I feel like it didn't flow as as good as as some other ones, then I wouldn't necessarily reach out to them again. And not to say that that interview came out bad, but like I just feel like if we didn't, if it wasn't a good back and forth. You know, because in the beginning, and I don't know how you do this, but I used to write down all my questions f- beforehand. You know, I would write everything down because I'm like, okay, I kind of, I don't want to miss anything. And like, and I, like, I felt like that was bad for me because I would stick too close to like just asking the questions and I didn't necessarily, it wasn't as much of a back and forth as it has been now. Now I just don't. But then that also has been has been bad because like if I don't even write little bullet points sometimes and their answers are too quick, like I've I've literally like asked my questions and and it's like done. And like they'll give me too short of an answer. And I'm like, well, fuck, dude, this has only been like it's only been like 30 minutes. Like, I don't know if I'm going to get this opportunity to talk to them again. So like then I'm like trying to like think of other stuff in the middle of the interview. Right. Like I'll ask them and it's like one sentence answer. How do you like when you're asking questions? You said you, you did it at one point. I I I've learned to do bullet points. Okay. I've I tried that whole. It's exactly the same experience. I tried that whole thing where you ask all of your you know have your set questions and then it just kind of goes nowhere. You know you. It's supposed to go in one direction, and you're not letting it. Um, yeah. And then I try that thing where you have no bullet points, and then I've. Comp- you know, I find at the end, I'm like, oh, I should have asked him about this thing. You know, so like bullet points are good. Like I have this thing with, um, I haven't put it up yet. I have an interview with a uh, Dan Slot um, that's coming up. Oh, nice. And then I really wanted to ask him about writing Bugs Bunny. Because I'm sure everybody's asking him about writing Spider-Man, of course. 
But I really wanted to ask him about writing Bugs Bunny because I'm like, how many times am I going to talk to somebody who's written Bugs Bunny? And then it was just pretty obvious, like really early on, that he didn't want to talk about Bugs Bunny. It's like, well, I guess I'm scrapping that. <laughs> did you did you ask about Ren and Stimpy? Well, I mean, it, it, you can't talk about his career without bringing up Ren, Ren and Stimpy, but I, I think he just didn't want to talk about the humor books because he felt he was being uh, pigeonholed into them. Oh, and you're you're a funny writer, Dan. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, that's cool. That's a, that's a good get right there, Dan Slot. He's a because of like how uh, not lecture funny, but how like volatile people could be towards him, you know? And yeah, with that vitriol, you know, like I mean, it's much like I mean, Liefeld, right? Like all the shade he gets thrown. I feel like Dan Slot has been thrown a lot of shade, and I probably guilty of some of the complaints i don't do it publicly i just talk about it with my friends if there's something i don't like i don't feel the need to get behind a keyboard and start typing hate out into the universe you know yeah i think the problem with someone like dan is like he just was the face of that whole broken spider marriage thing so everybody who loved the spider marriage like sees dan slot so here's the thing that i find funny about that right it's like all of the spider marriage guys love JMS. Who broke up the spider marriage? Yeah. JMS did. Yeah, like, that's true. That is true. <laughs> Slot had nothing to do with it. Like, because, I mean, I think also, like, um, one of the things that he told me was he gets on the book and he's told that they can't be together. So what's he going to do? Not write Spider-Man? Like, well, of course you're going to write Spider-Man. But yeah, he just he gets a lot of that flack, and I'm like, uh, oh, these these guys are just working, guys. Come on. For me though, for me uh, also, I think he was just on the book too long. I think he should have been. I I am not like. Don't get me wrong. Like we just both had mentioned the Thor run by Jason Aaron. That is a rare example of a writer Perfect. on a book for that many years and it being good and solid from beginning to end. And he left when he should have. Exactly. Dan Slott did not leave when he should have. And I also think, but, you know, I to be fair to him, I think editorial also plays a factor in terms of the type of books we're getting. I think that you can tell when editorial has no direction for a kid. When do you think he should have left? I don't know. I mean, the Parker Industries was not for me. I think that's where I that's where I, I dropped think, off. I think that I, I tried, dude. I powered through it. I powered because like I am a completist. So it's hard for me to like, okay, I'm gonna not get Spider-Man anymore. But I thought the height of his was superior Spider-Man. And it wasn't even Peter Parker. It was fucking Otto Octavius as Peter Parker. But I think that that was to me the best because it was something different that we hadn't ever seen before. You know, and I thought that. But Parker Industries was where I'm like, okay, dude, I can't. I'm sorry. Dude. Yeah. I can't really. I I was done at the end of Spider-Verse because, like, multiverses are my thing. I love multiverses. Same. And, um, and, like, you know, my first ever comics were who's who in the DC universe, right? So I'm like, I just love multiverses. So Spider-Verse should have been absolutely for me. But then it, it, it just ended on, like, for me, such a weak note that I'm like, Oh, okay, that's it. I'm done. This is as yeah. good. This has peaked, and I don't need to read more of this. And again, like I'm not. There's just there's a t it has to come a time, you know. If you've been on a book that long, where you just you, you gotta go, you know. I, I agree. Think that you need a new voice, especially in superhero comics, which can be so repetitive. You know, it's like a writer. I'm sh only has so many stories and are only allowed to do so much with a corporate character you know like you need something fresh sometimes it doesn't like you get that new writer and it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be better because yeah. i mean i don't necessarily like every time like i was very critical of donny cates taking over thor i'm like they should have let that book be gone for a little bit i you agree with that should have let thor just not be not have a book i would have been fine like it's a thor fan i'd have been fine give it a year no book you know, and then bring in somebody new because I felt like he like very abruptly kind of like kind of undid a lot of what Jason said, you know, what he built, even though Jason Aaron has said that he likes what Donnie's doing. 
Dude, do you agree with me or not when I say Jason Aaron is the third best Thor writer of all time? I'm uh, going Simonson, Stan, and Jack, and then Jason. It's hard for me to put Stan and I mean, you're putting Stan and Jack, so I don't want to throw shade on Jack. But in terms of like, I don't know. I mean, I, I can honestly say that, and, and people might throw shade on me for this, but I think that Bendis' Spider-Man run with Ultimate Spider-Man you could say is right, you know, like maybe tied with like the Ditko and and uh, Stan Lee stuff because I feel you, yeah. I like Jason Aaron better. I like Simon. Okay, Stan. don't get me wrong, but I like Jason Aaron's stuff better. But that's also because you know uh, it's for me going back and reading older stuff. Sometimes it's dated. Simonson's is not dated. I don't think Stan and Jack's is very dated. It's hard for me to read some of the. The early Marvel stuff, but yeah. I really like that with Fantastic Four, you know. But like some of the like the early Spider Man, like Peter Parker's a dick, you know. He is. He's a, I, that's he, what Dan Slott got that most writers yeah. don't get. Peter Parker's a dick. He's an asshole. He was so unlikable that as I was reading it, I'm like, why did people continue to want to read this character? He's a jerk. You know, and then it's not until what Ramita comes on the book where Peter's not as much of an asshole. I remember when the Andrew Garfield movie came out, and a lot of people are like, Oh, why is he such a jerk? And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you, he's a jerk. <laughs> That's what yeah. he is. Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but with uh so with Jason Aaron, the thing with like even after God Butcher, right? Eleven issues in, I just said, All right, he's like at least the third greatest Thor writer of all time, because this is just amazing. And then there's the rest of the run. And of course, everybody, you know, after Love and Thunder, everybody's going to be looking at this run, right? And the thing with Donny Cates is as good as Donny Cates is, nothing was going to follow that run. It wasn't going to be as well received. Nothing's like, that's just the way it is. Yeah, I mean, that's also why Jason Aaron didn't take over Captain America after Ed Brubaker. Because he, in my interview, he said it, like, they offered him Cap, and he kind of wanted to do it, but he's like, I'm not going to follow after Brubaker, and that's how he got onto Thor, because that's when they did all the shifting around with creators and putting them on new books and stuff like that, and the all, all I could think of was like, well, thank God you did turn Cap down, because we wouldn't have got this amazing Thor run, but, like, that is the problem, is when you follow a really, really well-received, critically acclaimed run on a character, that's when I think you do need the break. Because agree. you're going to have the fandom that's like, well, I love what you guys have been doing for years, and now you're just doing this. So you either have to do an abrupt turnaround, like what Mark Way did with Daredevil, which I thought was a good example of how to do it and where it, it was amazing. You know, like you had... Bendis, you had Brubaker. Well, Andy Diggle's run was not really well received at the end with Shadowland, but so I think he kind of he kind of reset it. But like maybe Andy Diggle was the example. You know, he started off strong, but then he just completely tanked at the end. You know, I remember this weird thing about that. Um, I remember Andy Diggle writing Shadowland number one, right? And what was it? Uh, Daredevil went bad. Yeah, he was running the hand. And then there was a. Uh... Mark Wade put out a thing where he said, there's a comic that's out this week, and he didn't mention which one it was. There's a comic that's out this week that just makes me think I'm done with superhero comics. There's It just regurgitates, you know, already really tired plot lines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, I wonder if this is Shadowland number one. And then, like, a month or so later, he has a writing assignment for Daredevil, and I'm like, oh, it's definitely Shadowland. Definitely. Some- <laughs> He definitely, like, that's what I think anyway. He definitely complained about it internally, and they're like, all right, you want the job? You got the job. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't wrong. Um, I, lo- I love Mark Wade. He's, a, he's another great get. I saw that you, he's, his interview with you is longer than any interview I have with him. Really? Yeah. I usually only get him for, like, 30 minutes. Oh, I mean, we, I had to reschedule him, too. So, like, I probably could have got longer. But when we sat down to record, he's like, hey, so I have bad news. I only have this much time. Or he's like, how much time were you looking for? I was like, I don't know, like an hour. And he's like, well, I can only do 45 minutes because I something came up. And I'm like, that's fine. Like, this is, 
I'm like, it's my fault. Like I rescheduled with you. So like, I can't get mad that you're telling me that. And um, it went a little bit over because the last question was Neil Adams. So he, you know, he obviously had stuff to say about him, but yeah, I love Mark Wade. He wrote my first comic. The first comic book I ever read was a flash. Really? He did. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Quality. Quality. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's why Wally West is still like my favorite character in comic books. Yeah. I'm glad he's back. Yeah. I know what, back. what they did to him was, it was an atrocity. And and I was constantly being trolled at the shop because my manager knows how much I love Wally West. And he would constantly, dude, constantly troll me with the fucking flash forward book that Scott Lobdell wrote. It's complete <laughs> garbage. Um, and that just, because he liked what Tom King did because he doesn't care about Wally West. So he's like, that was a great book. I'm like, no, they ruined him, dude. What are you talking about? They brought him back from during Rebirth and then they... They just trashed him again. It's like, I don't understand what they're doing. Um, Did you, you talked about, like, you knowing when editorial doesn't have a direction. And Wally West is totally that thing. Where it's like, all right, we're going to give the fans what they want with Wally. And then we have no idea what we're going to do with him afterwards. Yeah, I feel, yeah, I mean, and that's why, like, I love, you know, I'm going to go back. You said, what was one of my favorite people to interview? And Shelly Bond. Shelly Bond. I love talking to her. And I, I built some, like a kind of friendship with her over the past few years, you know, like to the point where I'm going to pick like her Kickstarter that ended, I'm going to pick up the books for her and, and drive it to her, you know? So she is cool. She is somebody that I fucking really admire and respect um, in comic books and is easily one of my favorite people to talk to. And I could continuously find stuff to talk to her about. Like, she, I feel like she's an endless wellspring of information, just the people that she's worked with. I think her outlook on comic books is unique because of the background she comes from. I just thought I'd throw that out there. It just made me think. It reminded me when we were talking about editorial. She's on my bucket list, too. I, I love talking to editors. It just, um, I learn a lot of stuff because I feel like when you're talking to writers and artists, a lot of stuff that they answer is visceral. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a lot of it is instinct. When you're talking to editors, it's almost like there's a science behind what they do. Like putting two people together, uh, knowing how to how to play them, you know, with each other, against each other. So I think that or, or knowing which books to publish or what to look for in a pitch. So all that stuff's really interesting to listen to. But also like it's kind of my bucket list to just kind of interview as many people who worked on Sandman as I can. <laughs> Neil gave it. Neil gave it was on the bucket list. I, that's that's somebody I forgot. Alan Moore will never happen for any of us. So that yeah. That's why I don't mention him. You know, but Neil, I have been told in no uncertain terms by five people that Alan Moore will never happen. Oh oh yeah. I mean, I don't. I won't even. I didn't even have a thought that he would. You know, if I if he if I could somehow reach him and he responded me and told me no, I would be happy with that. You know, like if I got a no from him directly, but yeah, I mean, it's clear. He just doesn't want to have anything to do with comics. And I've been told there's one way to, to get, you know, to maybe get Alan, which is you have to fly to Northampton. You got to find him. You got to talk to him. You got to make him like you. And then maybe he'll do your show. Cause you know, the biggest problem is that he doesn't have internet. I mean, he's not the first person. There was somebody else I asked and, uh, Oh, Chester Brown. When, when I interviewed him, he's like, I don't have a computer at home. And I was like, oh, all right. So he's like, so I have to go to the library. That's what he said, like when he answers his emails. So that was a, that was a phone interview. I did, he did it over his landline. But wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's weird to me when somebody tells me they don't have internet. Like, how do you, I want to say, how do you survive in this day and age? Because everything is done, especially during the pandemic. I mean, fuck. Yeah. There was no communication. You weren't seeing people, you know. Yeah, and even just doing things like online groceries and stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, with with the game and though, like uh, I, I emailed his publicist. What did they tell you? Uh, he's not doing interviews right now, and um, his schedule is is busy or whatever. I think something like that. Twice I've been told that. Okay, I was told the same thing with the words. Try back in two years. I did not get that. <laughs> I didn't get the try back in two years. That is pretty insane. Two, I know. 
You think I'm going to remember this email in two? I probably would remember. You're probably going to remember in two years that you got that email. So, um, yeah, it's crazy. He'll still be busy in two years. Yeah, he's not going to not be busy ever. I think he's going to constantly be busy. Yeah, he would be so great, though. Yeah, I feel like that would be an awesome conversation. I feel like there's just certain creators. I think you have to be so well known or an established like place for them to yeah. make the time. You know, like if we worked for like the Los Angeles Times, New York Times, something like that, a really big outlet, right? Like obviously that's why they do interviews with them because of the reach that they have. And that's not to say that what we're doing like isn't like worth talking to, you know, but I I get it in terms of for the publicist, right? Like somebody that's their publicist, they're like, well, who's this going to reach really? You know, like if we're trying to market, we're trying to promote, we want the biggest possible news outlets. And I, and I, I don't get mad at that. Like at first I used to get mad when I was told, like when I said the DC guy said, um, you don't have enough followers at first. I'm like, well, fuck you. You know, like, you know, like that was my instinct. Then I'm like, well, I guess, you know, if I really think about it, if, I'm trying to market something for myself. Like I'm going to want to go to the biggest possible thing, you know? But I think that like when I interviewed Todd, I thought it was cool what he said. He's like, I, I appreciate what you guys do. I appreciate all you guys that have your podcasts and your YouTube channels. And that's why I, I come on your shows. Like I thought that that, like that to me meant a lot hearing him say, yeah. you know? And I think that, you know, Tim Sale, like having him on was was super huge for me because like Long Halloween's my favorite Batman story of all time. I know most really? yeah. So you must have really liked the Batman. I did, but it wasn't a straight adaptation. They pulled certain things from Long Halloween, but I you know, we could do a whole episode on 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 how I feel about that movie. I hated what they did with the Riddler. I I did not I like the actual what that character is. I got yeah. That was an interesting villain, but it's not the Riddler by any stretch of the imagination. That is not the Riddler. You know, like that was, I, I don't want to, we don't have to get it. You know what I, you know what I like and don't like about that movie? It's, it's kind of intertwined. I like that Batman is a detective because we never see that in any movie. Right. Yeah. I don't like that he's kind of not good at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone literally solves everything for him. Yeah, that's a customer said that. He's like, he's stupid. He's actually not, he's not smart. That was his exact reaction to it. And he's like a diehard Batman fan. And he just, he's even, like, I won't call him out by name, but he's directed Batman fan films that have very huge followings on YouTube. So he's very critical of any Batman film. He's not a huge fan of the Christopher Nolan movies. So, like, I can see that. Yeah, I mean, I, I like them, but I was hoping for more with this movie. I thought it was well done. The music was good. The acting was good. Um, but, you know, it's an amalgamation of a lot of, of Batman books. So that's why, like, yes, I did like that they kind of pulled from the Long Halloween. But I want to see an actual Long Halloween movie. Like, if they're going to adapt it, then just adapt it. But you have to, like, they're never going to do that. They're never going to have that many villains in one movie and you can't do it in one movie that would have to be to me like you'd have to break that up at least into two like they did for the animated yeah i agree i agree with that yeah but yeah same thing like what todd told you is the same thing it's the same thing that uh sinkevich told me it's um you know everybody because what he said and this is really inspiring he said that everyone in life is either a cautionary tale or an inspiration so if you if you are doing good things, you're automatically an inspiration. So he's like really, you know, grateful for all of us with these shows and stuff. I like that. Yeah, I mean, because why do we do it? You know, we do it because we love comics. We're not doing. I'm not doing this to make a fucking ton of money. If if it can pay for my pot for my podcast hosting, then cool. You know, so at least if it's not costing me money to do. What I do, like that's that's really all I want. If I, I just want to break even, I just want to like not have it be, I don't want to say financial burden, but like that that's the only thing that that I want from the channel. And I, I like talking comics. I like spreading the love and passion for comics. Yeah, 
that's why I talk about what I talk about. That's why I cover the books that I cover on the channel, you know? And I like like show, showcasing the history of it. So this is yeah. like another thing that really bugs me, Ryan, is I think interviewing creators, artists, writers, I think all that is interesting stuff. And I understand Facebook groups and Reddit um, not wanting you to plug yourself. But if we're plugging interviews that we've done, I really don't think that's the same thing. I think that should be allowed because I'm like, I'm not plugging me. I'm plugging the person that I spoke to. And it's really frustrating because, like, you could get a lot more followers. You could get a lot more views if these things would just let you post stuff. I understand, but I think that there are some channels, not us maybe, that are doing it to make a living. So the way that these groups look at it is that you're just trying to make money by getting clicks through this group. You know, I'm assuming I could be completely wrong in that terms. But yes, I, I agree. I'm like, well, I'm just trying to share something about comics. Yeah, I cre I did the video. I made the video, but I'm trying to share it with you guys because you may be interested in watching it. You know, like I'm not promoting a book I'm selling. I'm not promoting something that I'm selling like that to me should not be allowed. I get yes. that. You know, I'm not pushing a Kickstarter into this group for a book that has nothing to do with like, a, like let's say a DC group and I'm doing a Kickstarter for a fucking slice of life book or a horror book like that to me is like, yeah, don't, don't let me post it. But I totally agree. And I've never understood why me sharing an interview doesn't get approved. You know, I don't understand why I can't plug my Brian Ballin interview in a Brian Ballin group. You know what I mean? What you really, yeah, they didn't let you. No, nope. that's that's weird. That that's really weird, right? That that's weird because I mean I posted my Jaime Hernandez in the Love and Rockets group. Nobody batted an eye. I've I've done a couple episodes on Love and Rockets in in there, and nobody's nobody's denied it. Yeah, that, I think it's different for every group, but yeah, but yeah. So here's a question that I get asked often. So I'm going to ask you: Do you make your own comics, and would you want to do it? No, and yes. That's What's the hold up the short and simple of it, you know, um, no, because I feel like, first of all, I don't draw, but that's, that's besides the point. I, I don't know. I just, it's hard for me to like motivate myself to do it because like, I'm either with my family, you know, I work all the time and I'm tired and like, I could use being tired as an excuse, but it's like, there is a point where like, I, okay, like what if I took some of the time that I'm doing on the YouTube channel? And devoted that to like making comments. And then I'm like, but I kept saying no, because I'm like, I need I want to get to a thousand subscribers. That was my my first goal. I'm like, I want to get to that thousand so that I can well, so I can monetize it. Cause like at, at this point, like I'm spending at least three with my domain name and the podcast host. It's like, you know, like and my editing software that I pay for, it's like 300 bucks a year. And I was like, I just want to be able to make that back yeah. so that i'm not like actually spending money on this you know and putting all this time into it but i'm losing technically i'm losing money right now that i've hit that thousand though it's like well what's what's my excuse now you know like it's kind of where, where i was at and um so the f i'm not necessarily making a comic but i'm doing um a hip-hop scene that i had ha i've been toying around with for a while and I just put it out into the Facebook group that we're both in. And I'm like, is this anybody want to get down on this? You know? So that, that will be the first thing that I'm going to do. But yes, I do want to make comics. What about you? No, not at all. <laughs> no, like I, I, I posted on, so I posted on Facebook like two weeks ago. I was like, I want to make an eight page comic. This eight page comic has been living in my brain for the last 15 years. I need an artist who can draw like Hal Foster, which is a tall order. And then Bill Sienkiewicz commented on it with, ooh. And then- I saw know, that, I saw that, yeah. So my friends list explodes. People are like, is Bill Sienkiewicz gonna draw your comic? I was like, I can't pay Bill Sienkiewicz, people. <laughs> Stop yeah. that. He, you know, so, but he did draw some eyeballs to it. Um, but it's just like, that comic is eight pages long. It's just, it's just one of those gags, you know, it was like one of those 
drawn out experimental layout things with a gag at the end. But after that, I'm like, one, I don't like every time I try to write a story, I'm one of those guys who just kind of sounds like now I'm just preaching and I'm just writing an essay. But at the same time, if I were going to draw it myself, I hate, like, I realize that I like the act of drawing, but I hate having to draw anything. So it's like, oh, what? Now I have to draw this building, the panel yeah. two. I have to draw this building again, you know? Yeah. And, oh my God, I give up. This is terrible. Yeah. Why yeah. does anyone do this? And that actually gives me the appreciation for these guys because I'm like, the discipline that these guys have to actually make comics, you know, and nobody does comics for for money, right? Like all of that, these guys yeah. are making comics because they love it. So that is something that uh, I don't take for granted. The reason that I think we get a lot of people on our shows is because you know they want to they want to talk comics and they want they, they love making comics. They love talking about comics just as much as we do. Yeah, I mean, and that's. And that's why, like, again, that's why I do it. It's because I like talking comic books. And I, it's my favorite medium. Like, if I, if you give me the option of watching TV or reading a comic, I always pick the comic. And, and I like to watch TV, but I would prefer, like, if I have quiet in my house, which is a very rare occurrence with a child, you know? then I'm going to read, you know, like I just, I love comic books so much. And like, there's so, there's so much that the comic book medium can do. And I has way more of a profound effect on me when I read like something really good, you know, like blankets by Craig Thompson, or, yeah. you know, something like that, like mouse, like there's just so much power in the comic book medium that you have in film and television too, but it just connects with me on a different level, you know? Same. Um, yeah, I I've used really that want... exact same wording. I'm like, if you give me the exact same story in a comic and a TV show, I'm going to read the comic. Yeah. And I won't watch an adaptation if I haven't read the book first either. Like, and, and some people are like, why not? You know, but I'm like, well, I want to read the source. I want to go to the source before I see an adaptation, you know? And that usually ruins the adaptation for me because I'm just like, yeah, good. I was going to say, do it the other way around, because I, because if I do it source first, then adaptation, I'm not going to like the adaptation. Yeah. Um, so I got to get ready for, for work soon. And Dude, I Dude, this was awesome. Could, uh, I feel like we could go for a long time. So I definitely, definitely want to do this with you again, because I feel like we could talk for hours. Before we go, do you know, you know, yeah. you, I, I, I've... I was saying you've I've had Mark wait on for forty minutes. You've had him for forty seven. You know who's had him for an hour is Daniel Fee. I know. I don't understand that. He gets. He gets, He has. I, he must know somebody. <laughs> I'm not saying the the amount of time he had Mark wait, but he must know somebody. And um, I don't know. I kind of want to ask him, but I don't want to at the same time. Like you know, everybody has their ways of getting people. Um, but maybe we should all share our ways with to help each other get the people we haven't had yet, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Cause but, um, I've had Wilson a couple of times, but you're already talking to his wife. That really is the big, the big thing to get Wills. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's not um, enough Wills Portasio interviews. Well, the reason for that is because a Wills Portasio interview can go for a while. I mean, I'm, I'm here for it, you know, yeah. I'll set, I'll set hours aside for him. Um, but I or my last interview with Wills literally ends with him doing this. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'm like, all right, you gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do not, like I said, I had a blast, um, talking with you and I definitely want to have, like, do this again, um, with you again in the future and everybody listening and watching, I'm going to drop your links down below. If you want to, you know, plug real quick, um, I'll drop your links. I'm gonna drop my links down below. Um, yeah. Comics Cube, youtube.com slash the comics cube. We uh I'm on Spotify, just search for the comics cube. Make sure it doesn't say the cosmic cube. I know a lot of you guys will automatically type that, but no, it's the comics cube. So yeah. Thank you, Ryan. This was awesome. Right, yeah, dude, I had a blast. And uh we'll we'll do something again soon for sure. Absolutely. Take care of yourself. You too.